Hello, everyone. Um, I thought about starting with some numbers and some statements from, 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 from TradFi, from banks, but I realized that's unnecessary because that's all in this booklet here. So if you want to see some justification why we're here, all here somewhere in the middle of the book. Um, I actually want to go right into it uh, before um, uh, getting to know Ben a little bit more, but right into tokenization. You've been, you've been for a while in that space, right? Um, so what evolved? What milestones did we see in the last, what is it now, five, six years? Um, so, and what failures as well? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, it's interesting and ironic that we're having this event today because tokenization is something that has been discussed and there's been trial and error really back since Ethereum launched eight years ago in mid-2015. And this idea of kind of taking an exogenous asset that lives off of a blockchain in legal documents or on, DT, on DTC and moving it on-chain has been this really magical idea. But by and large, it hasn't worked. Um, many probably remember uh, uh, the other three-letter acronym in 2017, STOs, Security Token Offerings, um, these were, you know, the slightly uh, more benevolent stepsister of ICOs. And the idea here was, you know, let's take an asset off-chain, um, an illiquid asset, could be an apartment building in Queens, let's tokenize it and distribute those tokens on-chain. And, you know, by doing so, we're going to create liquidity in an illiquid asset. And, you know, by and large, these experiments really didn't work. And the reason for that is just because you fractionalize something doesn't make it more liquid. You actually have to have demand for the fractional shares of, of that particular asset. And there were a number of high profile companies that, you know, doing STOs, everyone from Polymath to T0 to you know, Harbor, which, was, which raised $50 million of venture, uh, venture funding. And at the end of 2019, they all kind of died or withered at the vine. And, then the industry moved on to DeFi in 2020, you know, NFTs. There were more exciting things that kind of captured people's imagination. There were a few people that kept on building, Centrifuge being one of them, um, but uh, people kind of moved on. And um, that kind of takes us really to today in 2023. And what we're seeing now is something that I don't think we've seen before. And so I think this is actually a great time to really bring people together and have this discussion, which is we've seen this groundswell of teams focused on really solving this problem of bringing you know, real world assets onto a blockchain. And it's a very complex problem. It sounds simple, but it's complex. It involves a lot of legal nuance, a lot of smart contract nuance. Um, you're building marketplaces, you're solving the cold start problem. Uh, but Really, as a team, we started to notice maybe like 12, 18 months ago, an increasing number of teams building in this category. And now we're seeing you know, um, dozens of founders every month building in, in the real world asset space. Um, you know, many in this room have probably seen the headlines, you know, KKR tokenizing private equity funds, Franklin Templeton tokenizing short and intermediate term treasuries, you know, the California DMV is tokenizing 14 million automobile titles. Uh, so you, you've really seen uh, tokenization of, of really everything. And it's not just assets, you're also seeing tokenization of, of liabilities. So, you know, centrifuge as an example, and one, you know, one person's asset is, is another person's liability in, in the world of credit. Um, it's, it's probably a good thing we didn't call this conference the, the Real World Liability Summit. That would have probably not been a, been, been a good marketing decision. But I, I think like at its core, you know, what we've seen is, you know, um, uh, Boston Consulting Group recently put out a report that said there'll be 16 trillion of tokenized on-chain assets by, by the end of this decade. You, you've seen Larry Fink at BlackRock really reference this, the technology behind tokenization is powering really the next generation of, of capital markets. So we've seen this really like robust and exciting environment in 2023 that we really haven't seen for six, six or seven years. Yeah, but why now? Why, why, why we see that growth? I mean, you hinted on a few things, but like, 
What is happening in 2023 so that's different? I, I think that there are a number of different variables that have kind of coalesced. So, um, you know, we can talk about scaling, we can talk about blockchain infrastructure and UX UI, but I think there are kind of two macro things to call out. So one is stable coins. So stable coins are, you know, the OG RWA. Um, there's $120 billion of, of stable coins on chain. Uh, in 2022, there was $7 trillion of uh, run rate stable coin settlement. We're, in 2023, year to date, we're run rating at, at roughly 10 trillion. So we're keggering at a 40 to 50% year over year growth rate. Um, today, that, just to give you a sense of the magnitude that that represents, it's roughly 8% of all ACH payments, about 1% of Fedwire, which is the you know, Federal Reserve Growth Settlement System. So this is a technology that got off the ground in earnest six years ago, but um, you know, more seriously, like three years ago, and we're already at a scale that's, that's very meaningful. And so I think people are looking at stable coins and saying, well, you know, we have 24 seven rails that are global. Uh, we can settle instantly, use them in B2B payments and trade finance. Um, let's apply that same technology. If we can, if we can tokenize dollars, well, we can then tokenize real estate, we can tokenize other assets and get those same benefits. So I think that's one thing that people are paying attention to. I think the other thing is, is DeFi. And uh, you know, DeFi is in, in an interesting place right now um, as we've kind of followed it through the cycle. But what I think is unique about DeFi is smart contracts and software are incredibly efficient at performing financial functions and uh, at managing risk. Um, they're actually better, at, better than humans at managing risk, uh, I, I, would, I would posit. But um, you've seen kind of these incredible pipes get built that can execute if-then statements and execute logic um, very well, very efficiently. And people look at those pipes that have been built and say, well, those are incredible pipes that we can apply to traditional capital markets. The issue with the pipes right now is what's running through those pipes are, you know, long tail altcoins and things that institutions like don't want to touch, right? Institutions don't want to, you know, go long some DeFi token and short some other DeFi token. It's just not really relevant. And so if we can take these tokenized real world assets and run them uh, and power them using smart contracts, we're gonna start to see more water run through the pipes we've built. And right now it's, it's a trickle, but it's, it's starting to, to pick up and I think it's gonna, um, it's gonna only grow over time. Small step back, so, so just to why, why are we tokenizing in the first place? What are the benefits for the user, for the institution, for the, for the investor, why? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. So I think when we think about like why tokenization, I think it's such an important question because I think there are probably people that are, are skeptical, like why are, we, why are we doing this? Why are we here? Why are we tokenizing? Doesn't the existing financial system work pretty well? Um, so I think just taking a giant step back. So I think to understand like why we should tokenize assets, it's helpful to like think about like an untokenized asset. So like just like a normal real world asset. Like what is a, what is a real world asset? So it could be um, a bank deposit, right? Where you can go online and see a statement, right? It could be shares that you hold on Robinhood that sit with DTC. Um, if you make an investment in a startup, what do you own? Well, the founder maybe has a spreadsheet that keeps track of you know, who owns what. Maybe they issue those shares on Carta. Um, if you buy a car, there's a, you know, a, a, a local office that has like the vehicle titles, the DMV. Um, so we've built a world where we track asset ownership across a, a, mere, a, a very diverse range of databases. And typically like the issuer of these assets are the database administrators. If you own airline miles, um, you know, Delta is the database administrator. And um, this is kind of the system and patchwork that we've built up today over the past you know, 100 years of modern capital markets. Uh, it's a system that's you know, opaque, it's intermediated, uh, it's, it's rent seeking because typically you hold assets through, through a custodian, through a brokerage, and, and there's, there's fees that are, that are extracted. Um, and it's also analog, it's, you know, these, you know, it, it takes time to move assets, it's, you know, and it's, it's very manual. 
Um, and this isn't, you know, you know, this isn't the system we would build today from scratch. Like if we, if we were to rebuild the financial system from scratch today, just from a blank sheet of paper, I don't think anyone would think we'd rebuild, you know, what, what we, what the current system we, we have today. Um, the financial system today is, uh, you know, most of the code for SWIFT and other banking systems was written in the 1970s and 80s. Um, you know, most of the, the laws governing capital markets of the financial system were drafted in the 1930s and 40s, 33 Act, the 40 Act, these are foundational for all of our securities laws, all of finance. Um, and, uh, you know, it's still, when you send a cross-border payment, it goes through on average 2.6 correspondent banks, settles in, seven, settles in five to seven days. Um, you know, the financial system is, is just really ripe with, with inefficiency. And today, financial services is roughly 12, 11 to 12% of global GDP. It's been creeping up over the past couple of decades. And if you think about finance, financial services, it, as an industry, it doesn't produce anything that's inherently valuable, right? It's just a lubricant for other industries, healthcare, education, to, to actually connect capital with, with opportunity. So, you know, I think the lower financial services is, is as a percentage of GDP, the better. Uh, but we've kind of been moving in the wrong, in the wrong direction. So, Okay, so why tokenization? So that's the existing system we have today. So let's talk about why tokens are, are different. And um, this is a bit of a long-winded answer. So, but I, I really think it's important to, to, to really uh, think about all the different ways that tokenization is better. And, and as a team, when we've kind of whiteboarded it out, we kind of think about like five different characteristics that the tokens have that um, you know, are, are unique relative to kind of analog assets. So the first is, is modality. So every asset has like a natural speed and natural velocity. Like if you want to move an asset into cash, a, a T-bill, it settles T plus two. If you want to move an LP interest in a fund, you have to go through a fund administrator, find a buyer, there's friction there. It may take a month or more. Um, this idea of moving assets onto rails that are 24-7, 365, where the trade is the settlement, uh, there's no settlement or reconciliation process. The trade is the settlement, is, is a zero to one breakthrough. And um, this allows assets to move more quickly, more fluidly, and with less friction. One great parallel or an, um, analogy is the intermodal shipping supply chain. So in the 1950s, we moved to 20 by eight by eight crates, containers, shipping containers, to carry goods and services around the world. As a result of that, they built they built ocean liners that could more efficiently fit uh, a higher number of crates to increase utilization. They designed uh, chassis that could carry these crates. Um, uh, uh, um, shipping docks and ports designed cranes to lift them. And that, that lubricated the global supply chain. So if you were sending around clothing or electronics, it could move more efficiently. And that same analogy very much applies to this idea of putting an asset in the container of a token can move more efficiently on, on chain. So that's, that's one. Um, the second, I won't, I won't spend as much time on this, but is sovereignty, right? So if you think about most assets you own today, you own them through someone else. If you own tokens on Coinbase today, uh, congratulations, you're a, an unsecured creditor of Coinbase if they file for bankruptcy. They're not held in your name um, unless you hold them on, on the custody side and they're qualified custodian. But, um, the, the point being is most assets are held through other, other, um, other, uh, other companies and firms. And we learned this the hard way, right? With Lehman Brothers, if you had assets in the brokerage at Lehman Brothers when it filed for bankruptcy in 2008, it took you three years to get your, to get your stocks back. Um, so these things uh, don't matter until they matter a lot and they're the only thing that matter. Um, so it's, it's sovereignty. Um, the other thing is, so that's number two. The third is efficiency. So smart contracts, amazing at executing financial logic. And as someone, I, my background's in credit, as someone who studied the credit supply chain, a typical CLO deal, you have a calculation agent, payment agent, servicing agent, collateral agent. All these people extract VIG, a VIG along the way. Um, we've, we've also done some deep dives at Parify into, you know, the 
under like the plumbing of the financial system, like really boring stuff. But let me give you like a really simple example, which is if you're a public company, let's say Amazon, and you're paying a dividend, right? Your quarterly dividend. Uh, if you trace the cash from the bank account at Amazon to cash in th the three million shareholders of Amazon's accounts, that process is extremely complex. It feels simple, but it's extremely complex. There's a transfer agent that sits in between. Uh, those, that dividend is remitted via um, you know, EFT, ACH, um, sometimes debit cards and checks, believe it or not, because people are directly registered with Amazon. Um, you have dividend reinvestment programs. You have ECI tax withholding. Like a very simple financial function is actually like pretty expensive to execute, and that costs Amazon money which in turn costs shareholders money. So smart contracts are incredibly efficient. If you tokenize an asset, you know, things like amortization payments, interest payments, they run fluidly. Centrifuge is, is a case study for that, as, as are many others. Um, the last kind of two things are auditability. So if you think we have a whole financial audit industry built around verifying what people own. The beauty of a tokenized asset is you can see it all. There's no need for, for an audit, and everything is visible on chain. You can see all the rental payments, if there's a tokenized piece of real estate, and so on and so forth, and that's zero to one. And then the last thing is programmability. And this is like, we were talking about this, um, I think this morning. So we, we, this idea of being able to pre-program logic into assets is incredibly exciting. Really simple example, uh, you're leaving uh, money to your kids, you're, pa you're passing away, you put together a trust, and maybe that trust has a rule in it. I'm gonna give 50% of the money to my kid when they turn 40, the other 50% when they turn 60. In today's world, you hire a trust and a state lawyer, you pay a custodian you know, 30, 40, 50 bips a year just to execute that really simple logic, right? You can, with blockchains, with tokenized assets, pre-program that logic in and avoid all that cost and have less counterparty risk. So, you know, look, that's a really, really long-winded answer, but I think the why, uh, throughout the rest of the day, people will talk about the how, like how we're gonna make this happen, because I don't wanna trivialize it, it's really difficult. Like, there are a lot of difficult problems that still have to get solved, so we're not there yet, but I think the why is, is also really important, which is this is, zero to one and, and a much better financial system. I think I heard you like on, on number four, the, the audibility um, or transparency to, to, to some extent. I heard you a few weeks ago saying something, even if you would have looked at, sticking to the Lehman Brothers example, even if you have looked at Lehman Brothers reporting for the, the, the quarters before the 2008 crisis, you wouldn't have expected what happens. That can't happen in maker, compound, whatever, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I think most of the financial crises like we've had, if you look at like Enron, Lehman, uh, Archegos, um, most of them have been a function, like transparency would have likely mitigated those, those financial crises uh, because you can actually, when you can see something, when there's transparency, um, it, it reduces risk. When, there's, uh, when there isn't transparency, it increases risk. And a great example is a bank run, right? Even if a bank is, is solvent, there's no, there was no real-time transparency into, say, first reserves, you know, liquidity reserves, and that, that lack of transparency, I think, makes the financial system a lot, a lot more fragile. Let's talk about you for a moment. I mean, why are you doing what you're doing? Why Pyrofy? You came more from a traditional background. What happened in 17, 18? So, uh, yeah, so m my background is, I, I spent 10 years in, in, uh, in credit and private equity space, so I was with KKR, TPG, a couple other firms from kind of 2008 to, to 2018. Um, I got bitten with the Bitcoin bug in 2015, but I, it was kind of my a side hobby. What really captured my imagination was using MakerDAO in, in 2016, which uh, is effectively a, a revolving credit facility on chain. And, and the idea behind it is, you know, you can post collateral, borrow against it up to a certain loan to value ratio. And, uh, that experience of just using it, pressing a few buttons and, and you know, being issued credit without filling out forms, I, I thought was kind of like, it, it was my kind of zero to one moment. It captured my, my imagination. 
And ever since, I've been kind of a, you know, really interested in this space. Um, and so at Parify, we're, we, you know, we're focused on, on you know, not only decentralized finance, but this, we, we think this is really the, this idea of tokenizing assets is, is really the, the future of, of blockchains. It's difficult to imagine a world where you know, we see a lot of growth in this industry and ecosystem unless we solve, solve this problem. And so that's where we're, we're focused in terms of our portfolio and, and the founders that, that we support. And uh, through Parify, but, but even what you did before Parify, I mean, you see a lot of institutional investors, you see startups, you see all sides. So where are we in this cycle right now? Where are we? So right now, I think we've seen a significant amount of, of institutional interest in you know, uh, leveraging blockchains to um, move assets more easily. And I, I think we've, you know, we keep a list, I think they're around like two to 300 corporates, banks, large financial institutions that are pursuing uh, tokenization of, of different assets. And these are like, you know, kind of uh, the largest assets in the world, the short, short and intermediate term treasuries, all the way through to the longer tail of kind of more esoteric assets. And uh, things like carbon credits, agriculture, uh, et cetera. And um, we are in this period of growth. So right now there are roughly 3.2 billion of tokenized real world assets on chain. That's up about 50% since the beginning of the year. Um, that excludes stable coins. So this is all non-stable non coin. And we are seeing kind of you know, material momentum, um, both in, you know, just across pretty much every, every category. Um, and uh, it's, it's surprising, actually, to, to see. I, I wouldn't have necessarily underwritten to this level of interest at the beginning of the year, especially given what 2022 was like for crypto. But it's been, like, I think, surprising and, and, and really refreshing to Is it to see. because of 2022 was so shitty for crypto that we see this now? Yeah, I, I think that I think it was it was 2022 being shitty for crypto, and I think the banking crisis sure. kind of uh, catalyzed interest in actually having sovereign sovereign assets. Um, and Larry Fink, Fink referenced this. I mean, I'm curious, Max. I mean, you've you're in the trenches every day, building, talking to institutions, um, getting them to tokenize assets on chain. So what? And you've been doing this for a very long time. So I'll put it back in your court. What what are you you know what, what are you seeing right now? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll answer it more from a product perspective or from a technical perspective. But the the, the, the disclaimer is I'm actually not actively building anymore, so I'm 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 more on the sidelines, um, and I keep it really short because I want to ask you one more question before before I run out of time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're from a tech perspective, from a product perspective, over the last six years, we're ready now. I can see how the pieces come together. Like for instance, there was huge discussions over the years on what chain we use to tokenize. I don't think anybody gives a shit anymore because those babies talk to each other now. Um, we, we, we understand now that uh, um, compliance is needed. We understand that uh, uh, permissionless, while, while awesome, and that's actually the question I want to ask you, uh, needs uh, um, for corporates or for institutions some permissions. Um, and that brings me to the question, is, is actually DeFi a B2B play? to use some words. It's actually, is, is DeFi meant for retail, for consumers? Or is this just in our little bubble what we think? Um, my sense is, is there'll be mostly institutional and kind of prosumer users of, of DeFi. The reason being is financial, financial services are, are complex and the average person just wants to access money in their bank account and spend it and maybe earn some interest. Uh, but where the advantages are from, from blockchain is really in these like fast settlement, sovereignty, efficiency, all, all these kind of things we, we discussed. Um, so I think combining, th there's this new term floating around called you know, NoFi, um, which is, stands for non-custodial finance. Um, let's see if that term kind of has staying power. But the idea behind it is let's, let's take the best of uh, TradFi and DeFi and kind of mishmash and, and, and remix them together. And the idea is, what is DeFi good at? Well, DeFi is really good at efficient risk management. Um, you know, you basically have finance running on software rails. Uh, but what it's really not great at is, is UX, UI. Mm -hmm. uh, 
TradFi is actually better at UX UI. And so if you can kind of have a front end that's TradFi um, focused and easy to use, and then a back end that has the efficiencies of DeFi, we, we call it the DeFi mullet, um, you know, uh, TradFi on the front, DeFi in the back. That, that is kind of what, um, I, where I think kind of the puck is going and, and what we're seeing, because the reality is no one wants to deal with, with the complexity of this. 